Hello, good afternoon. So I'm very pleased that we are going to have this webinar and we're going to have many of these. So in that way, we can discuss many topics that can be of your interest. So let me go ahead and share my presentation. So in that way, we can jump and I start talking. So my name is uh, Dr. Davila. I'm a urologist at Vero Beach in Florida, and I'm part of Florida Healthcare Specialists and Florida Cancer Specialists. So today we're going to be talking about erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence in male. So the first question is, what is erectile dysfunction? Is the inability to maintain an erection hard enough to have intercourse. And here, how prevalent it is, is you know, almost 50% of patients over 40 years old, they will have some degree of erectile dysfunction. So we're talking about almost 40 million people, you know, men will have this problem. So it's quite common. Um, how, what is the process of an erection? So it's, it's very simple. Is is blood flow going to the penis and you have two cylinders. These cylinders get filled with blood and then you have an erection. What are the most common cause of erectile dysfunction? There are three. Vascular problem, we're gonna talk about that. Diabetes, we're gonna talk about that as well. But you know what I want you to look at this is 15% of the time I can fix the problem just by looking at the medications that you're taking. So please, if your family doctor, your cardiologist is starting you on a medication and then you start having erectile dysfunction, bring that to their attention because there are many other options that they can use. As well, we're gonna be talking about all the reasons where you get erectile dysfunctions and these are prostate cancer treatment, um, as I mentioned, diabetes and heart disease. Let's start with erectile dysfunction and diabetes. So diabetes, the, the reason it causes erectile dysfunction or ED is for two reasons. Number one, it, it, in, during diabetes, you have uh, nerve damage. And this nerve damage affect the communication between the brain and the penis. And therefore, there is not able to release nitric oxide and therefore in endothelial cells that are responsible for the vasodilation and therefore the rush of blood into the penis are not working well. So the nerves are not communicating well, the cells are not working well, therefore you don't have that much flow of blood flow to your penis and therefore you have the ED. This can um, increase the ED in men with diabetes, of course, uh, if they are older, and plus that they have diabetes, it's not gonna be helping, or how long they, the diabetes has been affecting them, how well they control the diabetes. And as we know, diabetes is one of these diseases that can affect many organs, among them kidney, heart. So therefore is something that is affecting the quality of life of these patients. So, ED and heart, and heart disease. I think this is an excellent topic that I always want to bring to the attention of my patients and I will tell you why. There are many publications that have shown that when you develop ED, usually happen two or three years before having a heart attack. So if I have a patient with ED, and he has not been seen by a cardiologist, I usually bring that to their attention and I encourage them to see a cardiologist to be evaluated uh, or the family doctors that they know about this type of publication, they usually do a workup for, uh, of this patient to make sure that they're not dealing with any heart problem. And it's very simple. Remember, I told you that the erections is based on blood flow into the penis. And this is, you know, the, the the blood vessels that are going to the penis are very small, one or two millimeters. So these can be affected very easy, very fast, you know, and, and as the blood vessels are getting bigger, it takes longer to be affected. 
So the first one ED followed by chest pain, which are the blood vessels that go to your heart. When they, they get hard, they're not dilating, therefore you get the chest pain and you can get a heart attack. So how can we decrease the risk of having ED and heart problems? So diet, exercise, you know, I always tell my patients, exercise is not necessarily mean that you have to go to the gym for an hour. No, there are many publications that show that if you go out and walk one or two miles per day, you will decrease, you, you will have a weight loss, and therefore you will increase your heart health, and you may not have erectile dysfunction. So as simple as walking every day. Now, prostate cancer. We know prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men. And um, so what happened with this is that, you know, when they do the prostate surgery and they remove the prostate, the nerves that are going to the penis are very close to the prostate. And sometimes even if you save this nerve, the erection can be affected. So, ED can present in up to 50% of patients after surgery or radiation. So it is important that when you get the diagnosis of prostate cancer, you talk about erectile dysfunction because that certainly will affect your quality of life. So what are the treatments that we offer to our patients with ED? So let's start with the oral medications. And as you see, we have many options. The oral medications, there are many in the market. All of them are, um, are excellent choices. They are effective between 50 and 85% of the time. And then um, diabetic patients, usually they're, they're, they don't respond as well as non-diabetic patients for, um, for these oral pills. The most common side effects that I see from my patients or they complain about it is headache, stuffy nose, so and therefore they stop it because the side effect, back pain, Cialis sometimes can give you back pain. So they're very effective, but they're not free of side effect, and you need to discuss that with your physician. What happens if you fail that? There, there are other options. So the vacuum device, which is a cylinder that will induce a negative pressure when you put it around the penis and therefore give you an erection. Once you have an erection, you will put the rubber band at the base of the penis so you will be able to entrap the blood in the cylinders inside the, the penis. And um, it's effective uh, between 60 to 80% of the time. What I have seen in my practice, 50% of my patients, they love it, and 50% hate it. So it's a 50-50. Um, some of the main complaint is you don't have ejaculation because at the base of the penis, you put the rubber band to keep the blood in the penis. And this is a, a complaint that bothers the patients. And sometimes you can have, you know, penile bruising, and one of the most common complaints of those patients that hate it is the lack of spontaneity. So you have to stop, find the cylinder, put it on the penis. Um, so it, it breaks the flow of having intercourse. We have the, a, a suppository that can be introduced in the urethra at the opening uh, on the head of the penis. And then these will induce an erection, okay? It is um, effective in up to 65% of the time. And, um, but again, it has to be refrigerated. So you have to have it of minus four and then find it, put it on, break the, um, the, the, the box, put, the, put it inside the urethra. So as well, it prevent the, the natural flow of having intercourse. And some of my patients, the most common complaint is pain. So, and they stop it. Then we have the injections. We have been using the injection for many, many years. And the, the main idea behind this injection is what? Induce a vasodilation of the blood vessels that are going to the penis, and therefore you have a blood flow filling the cylinders inside, and therefore you have an erection. You have to inject this before 
every time that you want to have intercourse and um some of the side effects that i have seen is a scar every in the place that you are injecting over time you can develop scar tissue sometimes pain or bleeding during intercourse after play injecting uh, these medications then the site of injection can bleed finally and i think a quite effective way to treat ed is the penal prosthesis or penile implant so basically what we are doing is placing two cylinders under the skin inside the penis connected to a pump and a reservoir so every time that the patient want to have intercourse they pump and the fluid go from the reservoir into the cylinders and therefore you can have an erection okay this is an outpatient procedure is usually take between 20 to 30 minutes you go home the same day and then it usually you can you can go ahead and start using the, the the implant between four weeks to six weeks and um the satisfaction of all the patients is as high as 98 percent and as well the partners are very happy about this um it can last between seven to ten years and about 90 to 94 percent of the time so what are the complications related with this well you know every time that we put something a prosthesis an implant there is always a risk of infection and this can be between one or two percent if you're diabetic sometimes that the, the infection rate can be a little higher and um but there are many ways to prevent this so it's always good to discuss it with the uh, urologists and talk about the different type of prosthesis and how you prevent the infection so I think that the implants, what I usually tell my patients is, is a solution that lasts for 10 years, seven to 10 years. Is It doesn't break the, 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 the flow of having intercourse. You know, um, the erection would last as long as the patient desired. Um, it, you will still have an orgasm, you will still have an ejaculation, and, um, and it's quite effective. And we have been using this for many, many years. Now, moving to another topic that is not as common as ED, but is, it is uh, equally affecting the quality of life of many of my patients. So this is what we call a stress urinary incontinence, and it can be the most common cause of incontinence in a man is, um, is prostate surgery. So after they have a prostatectomy uh, between nine to 16% of patients will develop incontinence, so meaning when they, they, they cough, they sneeze, or laugh, or they're playing golf, tennis, they're leaking. And this can, the prevalence around the world can be as high as 500,000 uh, men complaining of stress urinary incontinence. And the main idea or the main uh, problem that we have in this patient is you know, the prostate and the sphincter are two mechanisms that prevent us to leak. When you have a prostatectomy, that prostate is removed, then the sphincter is the only way to prevent leaking. And sometimes these sphincter can be affected during the surgery, and then you are incontinent. So as I say before, the most common cause of incontinence in men is after prostatectomy, it can be up to 16%. But the other reasons can give you incontinence, uh, Parkinson's, so a stroke, uh, multiple sclerosis, enlarged prostate. Um, radiation for prostate cancer can give you incontinence up to 2% of the time. And then of course, if you have a you know, car accident or a pelvic fracture that can affect the sphincter as well, sometimes can give you incontinence. So what are the treatment that we offer for these uh, group of patients. Well, you know, as we mentioned before, prostate cancer is the most common cause of uh, of cancer in men, and then um, about seventy thousand prostatectomies are done per year, and sixteen percent of these, between ten and sixteen percent, that will develop incontinence. So, so usually the way I I tell my patients is after prostatectomy, we usually give them 
what we call the pelvic floor exercise to start building up that sphincter. And we do this right after the surgery and we wait for a year, okay? And most of the patients recover the continent uh, during that first year. If after 12 months of the surgery, the patient is still leaking, then certainly we need to do something about this. What are the options? Well, from the less invasive to the more invasive, you know, less invasive, you know, decreased fluid intake, um, you know, you have to empty uh, every hour, hour and a half, so you don't stretch your bladder too much. Uh, as I say, we do the pelvic floor exercise with biofeedback in the office that are very effective. And, um, and patients start using pads, diapers. Sometimes even they consider to use catheter and penile pads. There are two options, male sling, which is basically giving that support with mesh behind the urethra uh, to prevent incontinence. And it's usually a good option for patients that doesn't have a severe incontinence. And usually the how severe is this, we measure by the number of pads that they use per day and how heavy are they at the end of the day. And then uh, we have the artificial sphincter that we do it all the time this type of surgery, which is an implant, which is a cuff around the urethra, connected to a pump. And then, you know, every time that the patient is willing to empty the bladder, they pump the cuff open and then they release themselves. So it is similar to having an sphincter. Um, usually this is a surgery is done under anesthesia. It take about 45 minutes to an hour. You go home the same day. You keep a Foley catheter in your bladder for 24 hours. And then you keep the sphincter open for four weeks or so. And then um, when you come back and four weeks to my office, we activate the sphincter and therefore you can start seeing the benefit of having. And being honest with you, this is, the sphincter is almost as efficient as the normal sphincter, and uh, it can make the patient almost 100% dry, between 80 to 100% uh, dry. So let's say patients were using 10 pads per day, now they can be down to one or two. So it's a significant improvement of their quality of life. So what are the possible side effects of this male sling or uh, artificial sphincter? Well, you know, there are two that are usually the most fierce complications that we always have as a surgeon is an infection, okay? So every time that we put an implant, we get concerned about infection and we're trying to prevent them and we do many things to prevent them and we discuss these to, with our patients. How frequently they happen? About one or two percent is usually happen during the first weeks after the surgery. And if they happen, you need to be removed. Then there is another group of complications. It can happen later on, which is what we call erosion. So this sphincter or the sling, they grow into other organs. So the sphincter, it went through the urethra. So now it's blocking the urine rather than opening and allowing the patient to empty well is doing a, is giving urinary retention to the patient, or sometimes it can grow outside the skin. So this, you see the sphincter or the pump outside in the scrotal area. So it's something that definitely needs to be fixed with another surgery. So um, the stress urinary incontinence is very common, you know, up to 16% after prostatectomy. Talk about these before having surgery, be aware what are the options, and, um, and then um, even if this happened to you, most of the time can be handled with pelvic floor exercise and within the first year this improved. But if you are part of that unlucky group uh, between 10 and 60%, then there are many options and very effective and, and efficient and you will um, regain again your quality of life. So it has been a pleasure for me to have these conversation with you. Now we're going to open some time to have more questions and answer and make this uh, educational experience better for all of you. Thank you very much.